The subject for this week is going to be moons. So it's going to be a little bit of a, a naturalist walk through the solar system these next couple of days. And I don't know that we'll finish this week. Uh, next, well, next week, we have the week off. Yay. And uh, there's, no, there's no Flipgrid assignment this week, I believe, which is really nice. So you guys can celebrate the holidays without worrying about that. Uh, but when we return, we're supposed to do comets and asteroids. Um, I don't know if that'll take an entire week, so maybe we'll continue this because there are a freaking ton of moons out there and we're inevitably going to have to pick some of our favorites. I also want to find time this week to talk about the rings uh, of Saturn. Mm. Actually, all of these gas uh, ice giants have rings. Um, and so there's moons of the ice giants, moons of uh, the gas giants, and then there's these trans-Neptune objects, which include Pluto. Um, and they're also very moon-like. And so we will, essentially today, I, I, we're just going to go through and um, I'm going to talk briefly about the formation hypotheses for these things, but they're, it's very, very, uh, some of these places we've only visited once, if ever, especially once we get out past Jupiter. Jupiter uh, will maybe spend the most amount of time on its moons because we've been observing them the longest and we can, we've had the chance to touch a lot of them in various ways, at least through flybys of their atmospheres and things like that. So, uh, you know, I want you guys to really consider the, as we make this naturalist tour of the moons, um, you're going to start to see maybe some patterns jump out and we can discuss them uh, in the review at the beginning of the next class, but they're, they're all very different and they all seem to speak to very different histories and, and different processes which have shaped uh, meant maybe they've gone through different processes that made them look the same or, or they look very different, uh, but very little is known. And there's a ton of work to be done about these, especially when it comes to formation. So one of the first things we'll do is, is talk about the basic formation hypotheses, but it's, it's very difficult to explain how, especially when like something like Jupiter has four very large moons, we call them the Galilean moons, and they're so very different from one another that explaining how they formed right there around Jupiter requires uh, really some imagination and perhaps tells us a bit about where Jupiter's been in the past. Um, oh no, it's not good. <coughs> I even got a new adapter. Come on. All right. Stay with me. Uh, all right, so let's check them out. Um, these are by far, these are by far the most well-studied um, moons beyond our own solar system or beyond our own uh, planetary system. Um, so we have closest to Jupiter, we have Io, we have Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And they're all quite interesting in their own ways, particularly uh, the ones that are getting the most attention are the ones that seem to promise the greatest possibility of finding something approximating life or conditions which would be hospitable to life uh, for our own interests, obviously. But I think we can also learn a lot about what it takes to, to make life on, in a solar system because Again, probably the greatest mystery in all of science is how does life form from no life? Because we've never seen that happen before. And in fact, it seems uh, somewhat preposterous that life would, you know, a great deal of modern biology was predicated on proving the idea that you can't get life without having life in the first place. So this is an extraordinary paradox that requires resolution. Maybe some of you will work on that one day. Um, if you if you should choose to, so we generally call these Jupiter one, two, three, and four, but in reality, there's eighty moons of Jupiter spread amongst these, and so 
It's not like Io is actually the first moon out from Jupiter. It's just the first big one that we can see really easily. Uh, and actually, has anybody seen the moons of Jupiter before? With a telescope or something? Yeah, they're, they're really easy to see, actually, even with binoculars. Now, Jupiter, we're moving past Jupiter right now, so it's not, the, it's still, I, I could see it last night. Uh, but if you get some binoculars out there um, on a nice clear night, you can see these things. And it's, it's kind of, a, it's an amazing experience, actually. Um, it really, it really changes the way that, that you look at the sky. I highly recommend everybody get out there. But um, this is sort of what Galileo saw when he um, punched up the very early spy glasses that he got from the Netherlands and made this 20x telescope. He was able to see uh, that there were actually moons and they did appear to orbit this, this star that they called Jupiter. And of course, this was like one of the first real nails in the coffin of geocentrism. Um, the phases of Venus was another one that we talked about. But the fact that we saw, or you know, that Galileo saw and others saw, actually there was there was a few other people who were writing about it at the same time who didn't get credit. But a lot of people started to use these new telescopes and sure enough, something was going around, something that they thought was a star, and it was becoming impossible to ignore that this was a process that happened all the time and probably was happening with our own system as well. Um, Galileo published that results in, in a little book he wrote, which was called Sverio Messenger. Um, it was written in, in Latin. And uh, it was a, a profound paradigm shift at the time. It really opened up a whole new era of astronomy with the telescopy and everything. So another thing that's kind of cool about these moons, and we'll, we'll see it plays really heavily into their physical characteristics and their stability and what keeps them warm and everything else is this very beautiful uh, musical resonance that plays out amongst them. Um, and again, you know, a resonance is, is just a situation where you have a periodic force that's being applied in a rhythm that coincides with the motion of that body already. So if you think about like pushing a little kid on a swing or something, if you push them at the wrong time, they fall off the swing, it's bad. But if you push them right when they're at the peak of it, then you can actually get a huge amount of force into the system because you're adding to the, the right directional motion of it at the same time. And that's what's happening with the moons as well. Each time one comes around, it gets a little tug at the right moment and you get these, these resonant uh, modes um, and they line up very beautifully with musical notes in that, you know, the orbits are with relation two to one um, and four to one with respect uh, to the first to the third. And actually this, the farthest uh, moon, Callisto, uh, doesn't have such a beautiful ratio, but it seems like it's converging and it will lock into an orbital resonance uh, with the others in the next few millions of years. So keep that in mind, that's gonna play a really important role in their internal structures as we dig in a bit deeper. Now, one thing that's really interesting is the mean density of these bodies decreases with their distance away from Jupiter. So Callisto is the farthest away um, and its density, can teach us that perhaps it has a composition that's somewhere uh, be intermediate between ice and rock, but Io, the innermost moon, uh, is extremely dense and, and has to have a density that's somewhere between rock and iron, which makes it really similar to, uh, say, our moon or even our planet. Uh, what else can we say about these guys? The... Uh, Um, Callisto, uh, again, that farthest away moon, um, seems like it has an equally distributed density and they get this from the wobble and the rotation of the moon itself. And, and this suggests the density is equally distributed. So it doesn't necessarily have a core that's distinct from the rest of it. And uh, this is important because people think that this might've been uh, how all of the moons were originally and that uh, through different processes, particularly the tidal heating, 
being very close to a body, um, differentiation can occur because there's molten layers and the heavy things will sink down through that. Um, and there's convection processes that occur and mix it up even more. So that's quite interesting. Uh, and the, the inner moons do, do seem to also, just by their own rotation, seem to display this, uh, this density distribution. Uh, they all have a little bit of a different surface situation going on. Um, Ganymede, for instance, that's the uh, big one, uh, seems to have some tectonic movement on its icy surface and that there's partial melting of the different layers below it. Um, whereas Europa seems more dynamic, like this is happening more often. It has a thinner ice crust. Uh, Io, on the other hand, on the interiors, is this crazy volcanic place with absolutely no ice at all. Um, although there is some tectonic uh, 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 features, like the, the mountains on it can't really be explained by volcanism, which is quite interesting. So all this kind of put together suggests that the nearer the moon is to Jupiter, the hotter it's going to be in its interior, and that's going to shape what its surface ends up looking like. But all of them basically seem to be largely explained by this tidal heating process, which we'll just keep coming back and back to. And of course, the tidal heating is directly a uh, result of the gravitational forces that it's feeling. And those, of course, vary with an inverse square of the distance. And so it's, you're getting a lot more gravity, uh, a lot more tidal heating close to Jupiter versus uh, Callisto, who's far away, receives almost, almost none. And uh, in everybody's case, uh, this seems to have melted the interior ice, uh, except for Callisto which uh, has allowed, you know, rock and iron to, to settle to the bottom, like I said. So very different cases. And, um, and, and these, uh, this distribution, in one sense, argues for their formation occurring uh, right there at Jupiter. But you can also imagine that um, various capture mechanisms would also result in the heavy things being close to the planet just from a gravitational perspective, too. So I, I think it's not wise to rule that out as well. Now, the way that, let, let's talk a minute about formation of these things in general. Um, generally speaking, we think about the formation of moons uh, around a, a gas giant as basically being the same process that happens with planets forming around a star. Uh, but whereas planets form in this protoplanetary disk, we have this thing called a circumplanetary disk for the moons, um, which is fed in some part by a lot of the debris from the circumstellar disk. But there's also these processes of heating from the planet that are contributing to uh, the formation processes. And it's the, the ideas have changed a lot um, in recent times. Uh, the basic, basic processes which are playing out are this pebble accretion uh, and collisions between the bodies. But the theory behind that is, is on the move. Um, again, pebble accretion is this idea that these particles from centimeters up to meters in diameters um, coalesce into planetesimals. Um, and then there's drag with the gas disk. We talked about this with the planet formation, which slows things down. There's little pockets that form that are voids that, again, lead to infilling. Um, but there is this serious crisis about uh, crossing the meter barrier with regard to these accretion processes, which nobody's really uh, figured out so far. Uh, and um, this is the idea that it's very difficult to get these uh, pebbles to make a boulder. Uh, it's, it's very tricky. And so, you know, people have tried to work around that uh, different ways by basically saying that the gas disk has uh, various instabilities, it has gaps. Um, there's little pressure bubbles that allow for uh, these little pebbles to come close together without gravity necessarily being the main player in that. Um, but it's, it's a big open field of investigation. So that's one to think about uh, if you end up going and studying these things further. And actually, every time I mention one of these gaps, it'd be really cool. You guys can, hopefully everybody's 
uh, coming along on your final project. Um, but these are really cool <laughs> topics to investigate um, because they're where the most interesting stuff is happening in the field. So just to give you a synopsis, so as recently as 2009, um, we had one sort of basic idea of how these moons formed. Then as recently as 2015, a, a new idea uh, was entered in, which involved the, uh, instead of just looking at the moons forming around uh, Jupiter, we started thinking about, oh, well, Jupiter must have changed its position in the, circum, uh, in the circumstellar disk. It must have wandered a fair amount uh, in order to account for some of these differences, right? For, for some of the, the icier bodies to have built up versus the, the hot ones. Uh, and then folks in the very recent years have started using the increasing ability of computers to simulate these different events, and they've come up with some uh, some more nuanced perspectives on that. And I'm going to play you a, a little simulation that uh, actually uh, one of my friends at Caltech did, which is pretty cool. Um, so the basic idea originally was that uh, or, or maybe 10 years ago, was that there were several generations of these moons. They, they were formed due to these processes we, we enumerated, and then they would crash into each other. Some of them would fall into Jupiter. The debris would be distributed, and then they would form new moons. So they were going through this iterative process. Um, and that basically the, the moons they were stuck with today are like fifth generation moons. And... Eventually, this orbital resonance was set up that stabilized them. Um, the next thing that happened was this grand tack hypothesis, which is uh, essentially this idea that the reversal of Jupiter's planetary migration as it came in and out closer to the sun uh, allowed for different stabilities to be achieved that could result in the different phenotypes of these moons. They're all very, very different from one another. Um, both in size and in composition. So uh, this was a pretty big step. Uh, and then recently, people have been trying to really hone in on that and discuss how these different gas uh, cavitations, how there'd be these gaps that would open up in the gas that would allow for the nucleation of some of these uh, you know, pebble to boulder uh, processes to unfold. So I thought that... Uh, I would just let uh, Constantine uh, explain this to you because he, he does this for a living. He makes these models and, and some of them are quite beautiful. Um, so let's just watch this little video from, Const this is Constantine Batigan at Caltech. And uh, he does, he, he not only models moons, but he's also mon modeling how some of these, uh, these extra solar system, these exoplanets are forming because this is sort of our best bet is looking at some of these other processes as they're happening. You know, when we look out at the greater galaxy, all we get is little snapshots, right? We'll see a disk here. We'll see some exoplanets here. And we have to put all those pieces together. That's like picking up a bunch of uh, out of order pages from a book and trying to make sense of them. Um, so I think that, uh, I think that Constantine does a good job of, of explaining the basic, thought process here. Based missions. The orbital machinery of these moons has been understood for centuries. The exact story of how these satellites formed, on the other hand, remains a remarkable mystery. And a new theory, drawing upon analytical calculations and large-scale computer simulations, is helping shed light on their origins. Jupiter was born within a protoplanetary disk that orbited the Sun during the first few million years of its lifetime, and as gas and dust rained down upon the newly born planet, Jupiter became encircled by its own circumplanetary disk of satellite building material. In time, this disk grew more and more dusty thanks to a balance between headwind and updraft attained by icy dust grains only about a millimeter in size. Eventually, the ring of dust around Jupiter became so massive that it collapsed under its own weight into thousands of satellite decimals, icy asteroid-like objects, about 100 kilometers across. The orbits of these satellite decimals are shown here as orange ellipses. Over thousands of years, 
satellitesimals coalesce into moons. The mass of the growing satellites is depicted here with a logarithmic bar chart on the right. As the mass of a moon crosses a threshold, it begins to raise spiral wakes in the gaseous nebula and migrates towards Jupiter, leaving behind a mess of satellitesimals to birth the next moon. Here we see the first two moons, Io and Europa, form in about 6,000 years. As sequential satellite formation unfolds, the orbits of satellite decimals grow more and more excited. Eccentric orbits slow down accretion and it takes longer and longer for additional moons to form. In fact, Ganymede makes its debut almost 30,000 years into the simulation. Close to Jupiter, the converging orbits of the first three moons stabilize, establishing the orbital clockwork of the Laplace resonance wherein for every four orbits that Io completes around Jupiter, Europa completes two and Ganymede goes around once, with the system returning to its initial state every 172 hours. Our calculations show that this celebrated orbital architecture must have been built from the inside out over a timescale no shorter than about 10,000 years. Eventually, radiation from the newborn sun evaporates the gas from the Circumjovian nebula, leaving behind a disk of icy debris and triggering the formation of Callisto. Because of the gas-free conditions in which Callisto forms, its conglomeration takes much longer than that of the other moons, nearly 9 million years. In particular, it achieves about half of its mass in the first 50,000 years, but then takes more than 8 million years to grow the rest of the way. Jupiter's moons are mysterious and fascinating places that contain water, salts, and maybe even the building blocks of life itself. Understanding the formation of Jupiter's moons helps us illuminate the intricate physical processes at play in the solar system's early evolution and unlock some of the deepest secrets held by the planets. Based missions. The orbital machinery of these moons has been understood for centuries. The exact story of how these satellites formed, on the other hand, remains uh so what's what's absolutely stunning to me is that these models have building moons in a matter of thousands of years uh and i'm not sure like to what degree um these models are accounting for all of the interesting factors that have been pulled out about these moons so again we know very little we have uh we have at best driven very close to them and we can make interesting density ideas about their interior but the complexities of that are quite nuanced um but wow moons forming in a few thousand years is just remarkable uh and it's a difficult idea to test because moons are too small to see uh through telescopes and other solar systems so we're not able to see moons appearing um, and most of the planetary formation processes seem to take millions of years, and so we're not likely to see any of those occurring on a human time scale either. So, you know, you got to take these simulations with a grain of salt, but I think that it's at least a cool way of visualizing it, regardless of the timetables. Um, if you want to hear more about this guy talking, we did a really cool podcast. Uh, he, he's talking more about the formation of planets and exoplanets, which is a really fun talk. Um, I put a link to that in the Moodle. All right, so let's uh, let's talk about Io first, which is one of the weirdest looking bodies in our solar system. Uh, it looks kind of like some rotten cheese or something. Um, so this is is the uh, this is Jupiter one, and it's the third largest of the Galilean moons, named after the mythological character Io, who was a priestess of Hera. Um, who then became one of Zeus's consorts. Um, and all of these ended up getting uh, Greek treatments um, after much arguments, especially when it comes to uh, Saturn and the, the other, uh, the, the, first, the, the later discovered bodies, because of course the astronomers wanted to name them after themselves and people fought back. Um, so Io is a, a little bit larger than our own moon, it's the fourth largest moon in the solar system, and it's got the highest density of any moon, which is quite interesting. So it has the, the most surface gravity of any moon, um, and it, it also is the driest of, of any uh, moon. It, it has very, very little water. Um, actually, the driest of any astronomical 
body in our solar system. It's also got um, hundreds of volcanoes, active volcanoes, uh, many, many more inactive volcanoes. And each time that we've um, gone and checked it out, it's changing. There's, there's new ones and some of the old ones have ceased. It's very, very happen in place. And so the first time we went out there was with the Pioneer missions, Pioneer 10 and 11. And uh, of course, we remember Pioneer from uh, the story of reaching out to distant aliens. Um, and Pioneer was able to do some radio tracking, which was able to improve our ideas about the density and the mass. So they were able to really key in on its uh, gravitational information. They also, in these first missions, found that it had a very thin atmosphere and uh, um, that it was participating in this really intense radiation belt. Uh, and we got pictures of it for the first time. So that was pretty cool. And this was back again in the early 70s. Um, later, uh, closer to the 80s, 1979, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 went by and brought some of these really uh, crispy close-up images back for us. Um, let's see, what can we say about that? This was the first time we really got this multicolored landscape with all these, these uh, very obvious craters, um, but they didn't seem to be impact craters, which was very surprising to everyone. And one of the most surprising things that was found on that Voyager mission was these plumes, there seem to be actual uh, emissions, these uh, emanations from the surface into the surrounding region, uh, which was absolutely surprising to everybody. And so this was the first uh, sort of hard evidence that there was some sort of heating going on within it, that there was something uh, that this, these tidal processes were playing a, a, a role and that, the, uh, that this might actually explain some of the other moons as well. And so they analyzed some of this, uh, some of this emanation um, and they started to suspect sulfur dioxide was involved. And we'll get to that more in a minute. Uh, it also turns out, and I think we talked about this briefly in terms of Jupiter's own magnetosphere that IO's and uh, emissions actually play an important role in the generation of the ionosphere, and they play an important role in the, uh, the magnetic and radio signals that we get back from Jupiter, because Jupiter gives off radio signals, and for a long time, we didn't understand why that was the case. Uh, flash forward a few years, um, the Galileo spacecraft got there in 1995, it took him six years. Mm. And the Galileo project was able to enter orbit there at Jupiter for two years. Uh, and it was able to detect this large iron core um, in Io, which was interesting. And, and it found that this was very similar iron core to the iron core that we suspect in most of the rocky planets, including our own. Uh, they were also able with Galileo to analyze these volcanic eruptions a bit more and found that they had some magmatic uh, components to them too, that they were indeed volcanism um, proper. Um, what else can we say? Oh, uh, you know, and this was also when this Galileo uh, mission went back, it found that things had changed quite a bit since the Voyager mission, which was very unexpected. And we generally think of uh, astronomical processes is being very slow, but several of the volcanoes had uh, had gone inactive, um, and there were surface changes that had happened too since they were there previously. Uh, flash forward a few more years, uh, December 2000, um, the Cassini spacecraft that was going off to Saturn passed by very quickly, um, very briefly, and spotted a, a brand new plume. Um, which was when they really started developing this theory of the radio signals uh, with regard to the ionosphere uh, production involving Io, which we talked a bit about last time. Flash forward a few more years, the New Horizons spacecraft uh, was going out to check out Pluto and the Kuiper Belt. Uh, 
and made a pass by of the Jovian system and, and scoped out IO in February 2007. And uh, again, they found even more volcanic eruptions that were occurring that were brand new since Galileo. So this was all very unexpected to see something so absolutely animated, um, which hadn't really been seen in the solar system up to that point. Um, even more recently, the Juno spacecraft launched in 2011, um, reached, uh, reached Jupiter in 2016. Um, and this mission was, uh, it was kind of interesting. It, it took on this very uh, strange orbit around Jupiter, which was a polar orbit. It went over the top. And so it only makes a few, uh, in, you know, it has to be perfectly lined up uh, with IO in order to get a good flyby. Um, it's actually not expected to get close until uh, next December 2023, and then it'll make another close pass by on February 3rd, 2024, very low altitude within a, a less than 2,000 kilometers of the surface of Io. And they're going to try to understand the gravitational field a bit more because that's what really allows them to make estimates about the layering and density effects and more about the core. They've also got this uh, pretty cool near-infrared spectrometer on board, um, which is going to allow them to see down into the volcanoes a bit and, and make some mapping, uh, subsurface mapping, which would be really awesome. Uh, and... We talked about the resonance. Actually, Constantine kind of explained the resonances for us already. You know, one thing that's really interesting is all these moons uh, are are tidally locked. Their faces, uh, they face the same face, just like our moon faces the planet, its host planet. And uh, this is a this seems to be a case in general for moons, and it's often uh, reported that the moon rotates synchronously with the planet that it's forming. So as the planet turns, the moon turns, and so forth, uh, and, and so forth. And the, therefore, the, the planet's uh, rotations are synchronous, so one side faces the other. Um, this is, uh, it's an interesting way of putting it. Um, I came across this really interesting article that actually Tesla wrote. Um, maybe a hundred years ago, and Tesla went nuts. He, he made this argument that uh, these moons don't actually rotate and that's not the proper way of thinking about them. Because uh, what would happen if you cut the moon loose and if all of a sudden you turned off gravity, if the moon was rotating truly, it should spiral off into the distance, right? But Tesla makes this mathematically compelling argument that Actually, if you turned off gravity, the moon would just drift off indefinitely. It wouldn't actually have that angular momentum, and therefore it's not proper to say that the moon is actually rotating. Rather, it's more like its face is tethered to the surface of the planet. So a minor detail, but I, I find that really fascinating, and you can read more about that. I'll put a link to that, uh, to his argument in the Moodle after class. Uh, what about magnetism? Um, we talked about this a little bit. I just want to review it. Um, so these, these plumes, these volcanic plumes, they release a great deal of ionized material into the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. And the effect of this is that it essentially inflates Jupiter's magnetic field. Jupiter already had a pretty serious magnetic field. These contributions from Io seem to double it, which is pretty cool. So they act like something of a, an amplifier. And so that magnetosphere of Jupiter sweeps up all these gases and dusts um, at some astounding rate, like a ton per second, which is absolutely crazy. And these, uh, these, these ionized molecules are, uh, you know, oxygen, chlorine, sulfur, um, sodium, potassium, basically very electrically active atoms. Um, which again are just being uh, kicked out of the the upper mantle of Io, and this process is kind of poorly understood. So, I think that's where a lot of the research is going to be um, aimed at in the future. 
I lost my cursor. No. There we go. So this is our best estimate for, for what it looks like on the interior. You basically have uh, a, a planet that's really, well, not planet, a moon that's uh, quite similar to ours. Um, it's silicate rock, iron. Um, actually, Io and Europa are, are quite similar to the terrestrial planets. Um, its density is 3.5 grams per centimeter cubed, which is the highest of any of the regular moons in the solar system. Um, much higher than the other Galilean satellites. And uh, it's about 5% larger than our moon's density. Uh, there's slight differentiation in the crust between the mantle. Um, the core seems to take up about 20% of its mass. And people are still playing with exactly where the core boundary lies. Um, it does not have its own internal magnetic uh, gener uh, dynamo, which is quite interesting. So despite the fact that it's differentiated, despite the fact that it's, uh, it's tidally heated sufficiently, it doesn't seem to pr uh, produce its own magnetic field, which is very strange. I think that the, I think that the production of magnetic fields is one of the, the least understood processes in all of um, planetary sciences because every time we come up with a theory for what creates magnetic fields, we find counterexamples in our own solar system that seem to uh, argue against that. Um, I mean, there's definitely venting going on here and on Venus as well. Um, there must be convection, but we don't see, and, and even here we have a solid iron core, but we don't have a magnetic field, which is very, very interesting. And so I think we're missing something pretty big about how these magnetic fields are, are generated. Now, it does have a transient induced magnetic field, which means that it's being um, inflicted by Jupiter. <clears throat> and so in order for that to happen, people do believe that there's got to be some sort of liquid convective area, at least at the surface. The idea is like there's something, some sort of a magma ocean that's like, you know, a few miles 30 miles or so below the surface. Uh, but little, you know, beyond these inferences, we haven't actually gone there. We haven't done the mapping yet, so we don't really know what's going on. Um, just to illustrate this idea of tidal effects. So unlike on the Earth and on the Moon, where we think a lot of our own heat comes from radioactive decay uh, of various isotopes, it's thought that Io's uh, Io's heat is almost entirely from this tidal dissipation, which is completely dependent on it being close to Jupiter. So if that were to change, um, we would think that it would freeze up very quickly. Um, oh, the, this 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 tidal this tidal forces um, they're they're way stronger than what we see with the, with ours with regard to the moon. So we obviously have tides. We talked about um, the tides on Earth with respect to the oceans. These tides are like 200 times as strong because Jupiter is, is very, very big and uh, Io is very close. And so this is thought to create, uh, sorry, did I say 200? I think it's more like a thousand. I actually don't have the number here in front of me. It does produce 200 times more heat uh, than radioactive decay would be capable of here on Earth. Um, I'll see if I can pull that, that number for you, but it's very, very, very strong tidal forcing. Um, another thing that's kind of interesting is when people went there, uh, when we first, well, not people, but when we sent Voyager, <clears throat> we expected to see a lot of craters, impact craters, and we didn't see any, hardly any, um, which was very strange. And I think this began to also uh, give us the idea that uh, even before the volcanism was apparent, that the surface was being constantly remodeled. <clears throat> and indeed it is like this, the surface must be geologically young, very terrestrial, uh, because as these volcanic materials flow out, they bury all of the, the history of any craters that would have happened. What about its uh, strange yellowish appearance? Um, it seems like this is the result of all these sulfur compounds. <laughs> 
um, silicates that are mixed with sulfur dioxide uh, gives it this mottled yellowish color. The sulfur also gets uh, damaged by radiation coming from the sun and from uh, Jupiter's intense radiation belt, which uh, results in some different sulfur compounds that give it this kind of these sort of reddish, these like reddish orange splotches. Um, here's a, here's a couple of pretty cool pictures of uh, a before and after. Um, this was an image taken. These are two different images taken by Galileo um, between 1999 and 2000. Um, just so you can see some of these uh, these lava pits. What do they call them? Um, just pyroclastic lakes um, that have come and disappeared and pro uh, and solidified. Um, these are considered to be basically like basalt, like what you would find out here among our own volcanoes. A lot of the rock is basalt, like. These are similar flows, which result in these dark spots and eventually that oxidize because of the uh, sulfur dioxide compounds in them. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of calderas more than actual mountainous volcanoes, which is interesting. So there are some mountains, but the mountains seem to be more of a tectonic um, matter. Uh, Here's a picture of one of those plumes, which is quite stunning, actually. Um, you can see there's just a tremendous amount of material being thrown up into the orbit around Jupiter. Um, there's, actually, there's actually two mechanisms by which these plumes are thought to form. Um, one of them is when the dissolved sulfur and sulfur dioxide gets uh, shot out of the vents and the lava lakes, which drags along some of the lava with it. Uh, Another one is thought to happen when the lava flows themselves actually vaporize some of that sulfur dioxide frost. So it sort of boils them off and shoots them um, into the atmosphere. And these are kind of the smaller ones. Uh, here's a picture of some of the mountains on Io. There, it seems like there's a few hundred mountains. Some of them, uh, some of them can be quite large uh, in the 10 mile height range, which is quite extraordinary. But None of them seem to be volcanic, which is interesting. Um, apparently, all of this uh, magma that's being spewed onto the surface is putting new pressures, new compressive forces and stresses on top of the crust, which is deforming it. And uh, these tectonic deformations are actually what lead to the mountain building, which is interesting. I think people thought they would see more of the, uh, like the Martian mountains that are, are very much volcanic or, you know, the mountains we have around here in the, in the Pacific Northwest are very volcanic in nature. Although there is some, certainly some folding as well, which you can see due to the tectonics. Uh, what about its atmosphere? Um, the atmosphere is detectable. It's very thin, um, mostly sulfur dioxide, which is really nasty stuff. Sulfur monoxide, some sodium chloride vapor, some atomized sulfur and oxygen. Uh, it's one of the only atmospheres with appreciable levels of oxygen, which is quite interesting. Um, but the atmosphere doesn't last very long. It's very transient. As soon as it uh, appears from different uh, chemical processes and venting, it's basically stripped away almost immediately by Jupiter's magnetosphere, which is why uh, we get all of those um, processes that we talked about with regards to the magnetic field in Jupiter. Okay, let's uh, move on and check out Europa. Um, Europa is the smallest of the Galilean moons. It's the sixth closest planet of all 80, and it is the sixth largest moon in the solar system. Yes. Uh, so how big is Europa to one compared to Earth? Yes, good question. Um, and, uh, this big. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, but hold on one second. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I started. I wish I'd got one of those for Aya. I got one for all of the other moons because I think that's a really good reference frame. I remember this one with the cross-label flight. Is that correct? You can remember the surface. Yeah, exactly. Um, we're going to talk about that. Actually, all of the moons that we're going to focus on are are ones that we think can teach us something about life. Since there's just so many, we we have to. You know, your textbook picks a few, and I kind of went with it. I don't know if I'll change that next year, but. Um, 
I feel like it's a better service to just examine in depth a few of these moons than to try to just say something very, you know, uh, shallow about all of them. There's just too many. There's hundreds and hundreds of moons. So, I mean, Jupiter has 80. And then, you know, Saturn, I don't remember how many Saturn has, but quite a few, and then so on and so forth. They all have quite a few. Um, so Europa uh, was also named mythically um, from the Greeks. Um, Europa was the Phoenician mother of King Minos of Crete. Am I saying that right? My Greek people? Minos? Yeah. Yeah? All right. So the Phoenicians come into play, which is interesting. Um, they're the, the unsung heroes of the ancient world, uh, wiped from the face of the earth by, by the Romans at the fall of Carthage. So uh, like we just previewed, Europa is a little bit smaller than our own moon. It's also made of some silicate rock, and it has a little water ice crust on it, probably an iron nickel core. Um, a little, little thin atmosphere, which is primarily oxygen. So there you go. That's really, that could be useful for life, right? Um, another interesting thing, Europa has this, it's, it's, it's a beautifully smooth surface. It's actually the most smooth body in the entire, entire solar system, um, which was one of the first signs that there, there might be some sort of a water ocean beneath it, um, which, of course, excited everyone with the possibility of extraterrestrial life. So there it is next to the moon, uh, quite comparable, actually, in size. Um, now, it's actually by far the least massive of all of these Galilean moons we've looked at so far, but it is more massive than all of the known moons um, that are smaller than itself in the solar system combined. So it's pretty big still. Um, and then by its density, we'll get into its composition a bit more later, but it seems like it's very similar to the terrestrial planets. Again, remind you of this orbital resonance, uh, which is, we really can't say enough about it. It's the reason for the stability. It's the reason for all of the sloshing effects, these tidal frictions. This is very important. Um, you know, if these orbital resonances weren't in place, for instance, the, the orbit would, be, would tend to circularize. And when the orbits become very circular, they don't slosh as much. And if they don't slosh as much, you don't have heating from the inside. You don't have the possibility for liquid water and um, other processes that are quite useful for keeping these things active. And of course, making them enticing to us as life forms that hope to find others like us out there, or at least places for us to, to dwell and study. So, we think that this, uh, this orbital resonance lends this tidal flexing process, which sort of twists and pulls on the interior, gives it heat and, and keeps it going. And all, ultimately, all of this energy is coming from Jupiter's own rotation, right? As it yanks these things around. So it's no insignificant factor that Jupiter is, is an enormous body, which uh, makes up a great deal of the material in the solar system. Um, other than the sun itself. Now, Europa's got this really strange uh, series of, of flows and cracks and fissures on the surface. Um, and these are, these are difficult to explain. The patterns of them have given scientists uh, no paucity of headaches because they, they, they can't totally be explained by the actual momentary rotation dynamics or by the tidal forcing specifically it's they seem to indicate that the that europa is actually tilted on its axis a few times because you know the crackings are at angles at which they shouldn't be otherwise and so they've used these cracks to try to make calculations about how its its history has changed and how uh how the pole may have shifted like truly shifted um in the past um, which actually uh, was an interesting geological mechanism that people were thinking about here on Earth back in the 1950s about the, true, the pole of the Earth shifting. There's this very, very interesting book that you should read sometime um, by Charles Hapgood. Uh, I think it's called The Wandering Earth. Nah, I can't remember the name of it. It's a great book, Charles Hapgood. Um, Einstein wrote the foreword to it which uh, kind of tells you how seriously entertained the idea was at the time, but 
Hopgood pulls together all of these interesting uh, anecdotes where, you know, they find these, uh, uh, these woolly mammoths that uh, were frozen in place around the time at the last ice age. You know, it seemed like they happened very quickly. And Hapgood was convinced that the crust of the earth had actually shifted very quickly, like in a minute or something, um, and caused the, the ice ages to happen, you know, why these places froze over. And that fell out of favor later, obviously, for different reasons. But uh, it seems to have actually, uh, it seems to be very important in the, the surface features of Europa, at least. Whether or not anything like that happened on Earth is very much uh, a matter of speculation right now. It also has these dark streaks across it, which they call lineae. Um, and... These seem to be actually uh, a result of, of eruptions of liquid through the cracks in the surface. So as it cracked due to stressing, um, sort of these flows would emerge um, and be spread across the surface. Um, and one thing that's interesting that came out of studying all these different cracks in linear is that it appears that the surface rotates a little bit faster than the interior, which is... Um, quite interesting because it, it indicates that perhaps that there, it, it gives, lends evidence to the idea that there's a subsurface ocean that covers the entire thing. So the outside could slip around on top of it, which is quite fascinating. Um, it's thought that at this point, the calculations seem to suggest that a full re revolution of the outer shell with respect to the interior takes a really long time, something like 12,000 years. Uh, what else do we see? So there's these little mottled uh, freckly features that you can see as well, in addition to the, the striations. They call these lenticulae, which is Latin for freckles. Um, many, there's a lot, there are domes and pits. Um, and folks think that there's a couple of hypotheses about this. Um, people think that they might have to do with warm ice uh, from the interior that's being uh, heated by these tidal processes. Um, welling up from little cracks. Uh, another uh, person suggests, or recently, um, a group at, at Austin suggested that these were the results of little lakes, little pockets uh, of, of water that had basically been, um, been formed through upwellings and uh, formed, perhaps evaporated later at the surface. Let's look at the interior of this thing. Um, not entirely dissimilar from the last one we looked at, except for this, this layer of water, which is thought to be around 100 kilometers thick, which is pretty serious, 62 miles thick, um, which is a bit more than our oceans, uh, quite a bit more, actually. Uh, I don't think there's much more to say about that. So there's a couple of different models. So some geologists, uh, ge geologists, uh, exogeologists, I suppose you'd call them, uh, favor this thick ice model where there's where it's basically going to be very difficult for us to get robots down to survey this thing. Uh, and there's other scientists who suggest that maybe it's only the ice at the, at the surface is only a few kilometers thick, which is, uh, and, and all of this is very much going to be sorted out when we go there eventually, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, it does have the, uh, let's see, no, no internal magnetic field. The, uh, this reddish brown stuff is quite interesting. Um, people are still working on, on making sense of that, but the thought right now is that it is sort of these uh, magnesium enriched compounds that are, are salty as a result of the deposits from the evaporating water at the surface. Uh, and there is certainly water being evaporated from the surface. We'll see that in just a second. Um, also some sulf sulfuric acid um, left behind, which could be results in these colored modeled features. There's also speculation that the colored regions could, could represent some organic compounds called tholins, which uh, are an essential ingredient for the establishment of uh, a lot of these abiogenesis theories. 
So making life from something, you got to have precursors, right? You need organic compounds to make a life form is the thought that um, these oceans might actually be a right place for that kind of thing to happen. Now, it doesn't mean that there's necessarily life there, but it does mean that maybe life could happen there. Uh, and then, you know, unlike Io, we think that there's a fair amount of radioactive uh, heating going on as well. Uh, it doesn't totally make sense um, that it would be only due to the tidal heating that we would keep this liquid layer of water. Something like um, um, we see we see that there should be there's probably like something like a hundred times more heat coming than would make sense um, by the heating by the radiogenics, but still it's not enough for the tidal heating to explain alone. So Hubble took uh, this is obviously an enhanced image, but Hubble in 2012 uh, spotted this plume of water vapor erupting near the South Pole, um, which is actually quite enormous. It's something like 20 times the height of Mount Everest. And there might be many other plumes that we can't see that are even smaller. And they, they do seem to be kind of episodic, like we can't see them from year to year. Um, but this supports the idea that, that there's some tidal, more of these tidal forcing processes are quite strong and they're yanking out that subsurface uh, water as they go. Uh, they also, they're also quite interesting because they seem like they might provide little portals through the ice for us, right? Even if we have a thick ice model for the surface of the sky, perhaps there's a way to get down through some of these, uh, maybe even extinct geyser holes, things like that. Um, the tidal forces here on Europa uh, are a thousand times stronger than the moon on Earth. This is what I was speaking about earlier. So... This means that the eruptions of these geysers are quite strong. And we're going to talk about Enceladus also has geysers, but the eruptions here are like, let's see, uh, you know, I want to say like a thousand times as strong, at least a hundred times as strong as those on Enceladus. So we're hoping to make some flybys soon and actually scoop up some of these materials and without having to to drill down into it. So we might be able to actually sample this ocean through these geysers. This will be really cool. Um, we'll talk about those missions that are planned here in a minute. So no, so far, um, you know, just talking about the habitability of this thing, there's no direct evidence that there's life on Europa, um, but it does seem like its oceans could be could have regions that are similar to our own hydrothermal vents. And the more that we, st I mean, even studying our own hydrothermal vents is a very nascent science here on Earth. It's a very difficult place to access at the bottom of the sea. But when we do visit it, we find strange life forms that are nothing like the ones that are crawling around in this room right now. Things that are breathing metals and living under extraordinary um, anoxic conditions. There's nothing to breathe, you know, in the sense of oxygen. Um, so there is potential for this kind of a situation in Europa. And it's thought that if we can get down to those hydrothermal vents, we might be able to find some sort of strange um, and not, well, not even too strange, but uh, life forms similar to the ones that we would find on our own uh, vents, which will be shocking. Um, again, you know, I think half the reason people are so desperate to find a life form is because it will really help us zip up that story of how this a whoa almost fell off. how this abiogenesis actually happens, right? It's like the biggest mystery in all of science. It's so bizarre and so contradictory to everything that we see. If we can find life forms on another planet, maybe we can uh, start to triangulate what's similar, what's different, what processes led them to evolve. Um, you know, it's also very much considered that. Um, you know, if we find life forms there, people are going to start throwing around the idea of, well, maybe they came from Earth in the first place. Maybe we contaminated it. Maybe, uh, you know, because if we start drilling, there's no way we can clear all of the uh, microbes off of our drills perfectly. I think the allowable limit still allows for thousands of little microbes to be on these NASA probes. And this is a huge debate when it comes to exploring Mars right now, too. Um, uh, maybe maybe a uh, 
a meteor struck the earth and entombed some spores inside of it and sent those off and they ended up on Europa too. So it's going to be very difficult to, to tease apart whether the life forms were actually formed there in the first place or not, unless they're substantially different. Um, of course, then you got to deal with all the evolutionary processes that could have led to that. So they've also detected the presence of these clay-like minerals, which are called uh, phyllosilicates, uh, which are very often associated with organic materials here on Earth. And we think we see them in the icy crust. And so people think that, you know, this could indicate that there are, that some of these traveling meteors that contain organic stuff from our own planet could be smashing into um, Europa. So what about its atmosphere? Um, the atmosphere is pretty cool. It's primarily co uh, composed of oxygen. Um, there's a little bit of water vapor too. Now, it's thought that obviously since we haven't detected life, it's thought that this oxygen is produced uh, non-biologically because um, we, we can't say that it's made by, by organisms like on Earth. The general theory, um, which is a little bit on the move right now, was that all of the oxygen appeared due to the presence uh, the appearance of plants fairly recently in our own history. Um, certainly a lot of that oxygen probably did come from plants, but uh, there's other processes too. Of course, water itself contains a tremendous amount of oxygen um, and uh, through different chemistries, you can get the production of molecular oxygen as a result of that, um, which really just involves it getting split up by radiolysis, so radiation both from Jupiter and, and from the sun. Um, and a lot of that atmosphere is escaping. Uh, you know, Europa is actually one of only three different bodies uh, amongst all the planets and moons that has oxygen in its atmosphere, which is quite fascinating. Um, but despite this, it actually has no weather, which is very strange. No wind, no precipitation. Um, no coloring of the sky. Um, and that's because it's thought that the gravity is too weak. It only has about 13% of the gravity of the Earth, um, which is not too far off from, from our own moon. It's also very, very cold there. Um, and cold means not a lot of motion, right? So the temperature varies from minus 160 degrees Celsius at the equator to minus 220 Celsius at the poles. Um, so if, if this liquid water exists, it's probably insulated down below that ice sheet, and it's probably being maintained by those tidal forces. You know, there's a lot of discussion of robotic missions. I think I hinted at those already. Um, this is going to be a huge problem, though, because it, it receives absolutely extraordinary doses of radiation. Um, due to Jupiter's magnetosphere and that ionic uh, belt that's created. So the scientists are really struggling with how to make probes that can fight against this, uh, this hurdle. And uh, the, the, some of the best plans ha have involved some sort of a, uh, as opposed to making a, a mechanical drilling device, that you would make something that basically uh, was a heater, like a nuclear-powered heater like a space heater, and you drop it on the surface and it sort of melts its way down slowly uh, below the surface. And of course, once it gets down into the ice, it should be shielded sufficiently that uh, it can perform its tasks. Um, you know, I feel like, well, we got 10 minutes. Let's just dive into Ganymede here. All right, so Ganymede. Ganymede, Jupiter 3, is the biggest and the most massive of all of the moons in the solar system. It is a real giant. Here, a preview of the size of it for you there. Um, quite a bit bigger than our own moon. Um, it's the ninth largest object in the entire solar system. And it is the biggest one that doesn't have an atmosphere. So... Although it's not the most, it's not the most massive though. Um, Mercury is actually the most massive without an atmosphere. Let's see. It does seem to have a metallic core, um, which is interesting. And it is the only moon that has a magnetic field of its own, which is interesting too. So again, this magnetic field anomaly is very strange. Again, people are proposing that Ganymede's magnetic field is created by convection, 
uh, within its liquid iron core, which could be the case, um, but it doesn't seem to have all of that uh, amazing surface volcanism and uh, tectonic stuff that we would associate normally with the production of convection. So there's always a problem um, when you try to explain these magnetic fields. It was, uh, it was named um, after the mythological character, Ganymede, who was a Trojan prince desired by Zeus. Zeus was a very lustful dude, apparently, um, who carried him off uh, to be some sort of servant of the gods. I don't know too much more about that story. Uh, it seems like Ganymede actually may have been one of the first moons that was observed. There's a record actually going into ancient China, um, fourth century BC, uh, where somebody reported spotting this moon, what people think was this moon due to the drawings that were produced um, with the naked eye, which is hard to imagine. I've tried many times to see, I, I don't have great vision, but uh, I, I have not been able to see the moons of Jupiter with the naked eye. Has anybody out here ever seen the moons without, without, your, without a telescope, huh? Some people say they can do it, yeah. I remember thinking of my watch that like, uh, shows me where the planets are. Mm. And so uh, I figure out like, hey, this moon's kind of near Earth, I'll look at the moon sky. And you've, you've seen some of the moons of Jupiter that way? Yeah. That's incredible. So yeah, I guess yeah, some... I uh, yeah, binoculars, telescope, we just have, like, even we have a little scope that you can see really well through. Just, I used to do this when I was a kid. Yeah, that works too. That's a complicated physical process we should talk about at some point. Um, so this, this Chinese dude uh, in antiquity claimed to have seen them. Um, one thing that's kind of weird, though, is he reported the color of it to be reddish, uh, which is, is strange because even if you can see those things, I don't know that you could see a reddish color. And I don't know, it does actually seem to have a little bit of a reddish color to it. Um, of course, the main observations came from Galileo much later in 1610. Uh, now, Galileo tried really hard to name these, by the way, after his sponsors, which is really funny, um, the Medicis. It didn't stick. Um, people, people wanted to stick with the tradition of the Roman myths. <clears throat> and people have been fighting about this ever since. Uh, we'll talk about it once we get out to Saturn, especially like everybody who discovers the new moon wants to put their name on it and they have to be sort of beaten back off of the ledge with it. So he calls them, he called the uh, Galileo originally called them the Medician stars. Um, didn't stick. Yeah, let's you guys, let's just stop here. I, I want to make sure I don't want to get rushed with this. And um, there's so much to say. So we'll we'll finish the Galilean moons next time. Then we'll talk about Saturn and its rings, and eventually we'll get out to the icy, the icy worlds. Uh, if you have questions, come see me afterwards. You guys have a great week.